But this is not enough. What we need is participatory democracy. We need those voices in business and right and on the right side of the camp and, and, then, and on the left side and everywhere in between. We need those to be more engaged, not less engaged. That is what we suffer from. Uh, and for us to have a much more robust process of engagement, certainly. Um, there's other things there, but uh, yeah, we'll leave it. I'll leave it there. No, thank, thanks for coming up and sharing those views. Um, I, I have to take issue though on several of them, and that's why we get to have this open debate. Uh, there is nothing being discussed uh, about the price of oil for recall. I don't know how much history you know about me, but I've never been part of that 44 years of PC um, dominance. I've always wanted recall, even when they were in. I wanted to recall Jim Dinning when he brought in this so-called uh, uh, the, the power grid and that we're going to deregulate it. Uh, it wasn't deregulated. It wasn't there. And I have looked and read and studied uh, politics for uh, over 40 years of my life. And the fact uh, accountability once every four years, sir, isn't isn't accountability. That, that's a free for all, and it is. It's absolute power for four years, and they they impose their ideology on us or their uh, agenda, whatever it is. And there's nothing that we the people can do. And once every four four years is why I believe when you say people aren't engaged, it's because why bother? Why waste my time and why vote once every four years when the day afterwards they can break their promises and there's nothing I can do? I actually think, and I agree with you, I understand, we need to raise a level of participation. We need to have every voter think that, wow, my vote counts. I can make a difference. One of the other things that when I was an MLA, I went to, I was on the, uh, the members service committee and one of the things that frustrated me was how they uh, actually uh, well, divide up the money for re research in opposition parties. And one of the problems and one of the things that I presented to the member service was the fact that I think that every Albertan who votes, whether it's for the Green Party or whether it's for the Wild Rose or the NDP or anything in between, that that opposition caucus should get $5 for every vote that they get across the province because some of the areas I was running, people say, oh, there's no point in me voting, I'm an NDP, and my vote doesn't count for any, anything. But if we actually had a system to where the opposition, the NDP, oh, they're gonna get $5 to their research budget, my vote counts, and numbers count, it makes a difference in participating in democracy. And our system is set up such by whoever's in power, I don't care whether it's the left or the right, they want to uh, put all the difficult situations possible to oppress the people to have any desire to get out and to vote or to make their vote count. And there's lots of ways that we could be innovative to make votes count. Um, I also think that what you could have is the opposition parties each, like, uh, I'll go back to the 2004 election. My numbers are probably rusty now, but I think Ralph got like 480,000 votes. Uh, Kevin Taft had like 240,000 votes. You had Brian Mason with 80,000 votes. And you had uh, the Wild, uh, or the Alberta Alliance with 72,000 votes. Um, I sat in the opposition, and there were many times when the Liberals, the NDP, and the Alberta Alliance were opposed to the government. And if you were to actually have two votes in there, once with the elected representatives, and then a second vote by the leaders of each party they represent for the number of Albertans in order to pass a bill, we could have stopped the Conservatives on many accounts because we had like 502,000 Albertans vote for opposition and only 480 for the government. And so there's lots of ways that we could actually have participation and people realizing, wow, my vote counts. I need to get out there so that uh, Kevin Taft has 240,000 votes for the second vote for the overall vote of Alberta. And, and those are things that if we want to talk about improving democracy, we absolutely could. But today, right now, what I'm worried about is holding governments accountable. There's nothing that bothers me more when I hear the opposition saying, oh, we're holding their feet to the fire. Aren't we doing a fine job? And no, these guys are all firewalkers. It doesn't bother them a bit that you can accost them, say all these nasty things, because they still uh, get to vote, and on they go. And you can say, oh, it was wonderful, you know, we got to hold their feet to the fire. No, holding their feet to the fire 
is being able to actually fire them. We hired them, we want to be able to fire them. But anyways, I, I hope that answers a few of your questions and things that we can go, but, but recall, it needs to be constitutional that only the people can rescind it or amend it. And maybe we want to amend it so only 40%. Maybe we find that we people, really we need to be 60%, but only through the will of the people, never put it in the hands of the legislature to change or alter that any more than a constitution. Well, that's uh, very interesting. Now I'm going to play devil's advocate a bit here. And, and I'm wondering, now couldn't this be used by opposition parties just as a ploy to bother the government, get in the way, and prevent actual progress from going forward? Like, you know, sometimes governments make a decision. In the end, it turns out it was a bad decision. But you make the decision and you go forward because at least there's some form of progress. So wouldn't we possibly have kind of a circus happening with, uh, you know, especially when people are doing a lot of black backroom dealing and going, I know, let's recall them on this issue, when perhaps there's actually no real reason to, but it's just a great way to frustrate them. Uh, another one of the ex excellent, uh, what would I say, this reasons on why we why we need to look at it closely. And again, it kind of goes along the line of the instability, you know, can you create that? Uh, first of all, one of the problems I feel why we get such uh, divergence in our opinion is is that we have two views often, whether you want to call it the left or the right, um, big government versus small government. And what happens is is that the pendulum always swings too far in my opinion. You get the extreme on, on the right or the extreme on the left. And at that point, you get people that react. And like I say, that you, you made this comment that the conservatives never did put it in. Well, I, I brought that legislation forward, and uh, they were adamantly against it. Uh, now, even now, there's many conservatives before the UCP came together that when they were in opposition and the Wild Rose brought forward, they argued against recall. And so it, it's not just, you know, this rebound effect that, you know, I'm mad and I want to go back. To me, it actually reduces the pendulum from swinging so far. You don't make such extreme promises, but it's a, it's a valid concern. Um, is it going to create that instability? Are people going to get upset? But I think until we've tried it a few times and we realize that, oh, this isn't working or that we need to raise the number of people to do it, um, I, I don't believe that if we actually were allowed to exercise recall that we would find that that would be a result of it, especially when I'm talking the 50% plus one. If you're talking 10 or 15 or 20%, I absolutely agree. I, I, don't, I would rather have no recall than to have a minority that has that power to put us into that chaos and no progress ever being able to be accomplished because a small minority don't want to allow what the public good might be in favor of. Mm -hmm. Now, you had another comment, right? Did Martin you want the mic, please? should come behind yeah. the things, okay. please. Again, I just wanted to uh, say, um, in principle, I think is a good idea. Um, so it seems to be working really well in Venezuela. They've had about 16 um, elections over the last uh, 15, 16 years. Uh, how, how, however, when we live in a society where there's the dictatorship of the marketplace and economic power buys political power, you get a situation where there's no equality of opportunity, no equitability of outcome. So in such a situation, you often get special interests who are tied to big business. So my big concern is groups like the Worldwide Coalition Against uh, Islam uh, that did, you know, friends that come out to these events actually support uh, putting forth a recall to uh, make our society more exclusive, uh, you know, more hateful. Uh, or Arthur Pulowski and his uh, band of bigots that uh, recently got violent uh, with some, uh, some folks down at City Hall. Um, I'm worried that his ties to, uh, to to big, big, big money is uh, is big. His, his tie to big money is actually a, a problem because we will institute policies through recall that will actually diminish um, ex uh, inclusivity and participation in our society. Because there are right now in Calgary um, many bigoted groups, whether it's Free Church, whether it's Worldwide Coalition Against. Uh, um, 
uh, against Islam, whether it's the three percenters. Uh, and you can laugh all you want, but that just goes to show your own political, your own political uh, background. You know, I, I kind of think you're a fascist, especially when somebody goes out to a rally and makes sure that everybody knows your name. Everybody on the opposition knows your name every time they go. That makes it unsafe for that person. I, I, I feel it's very problematic when people actually talk to people like that. But anyway, okay, yeah. I'll get to the point. Yeah. Is, not yeah, any yeah. is, is that, well, um, yeah, when we have seven, eight bigoted groups that are tied to big money, tied to politicians, tied to political parties, because these people from WCI, these people from the three percenters, they actually volunteer for the Wild Wolf. They volunteer for the United um, Conservative Party. And when you have those people having such a strong influence, already in society where the dictatorship of the market doesn't allow for equality of opportunity and equitability of outcome. You get a situation where if you have recall, where their own vested interests of bigotry and hate um, are, are given a platform to influence policy in our society, and that is very, very dangerous. I, I appreciate you sharing your view again on that, but I, I actually think that if you were to review it, or if we were to actually have it, that you'd find it would be just the opposite. Those, those extremists at the 5 or 10% that are trying to impose their their lifestyle on us, whatever it is, would actually realize that they're not a majority, and I think it would be the counter opposite of what you're saying there. I think that our, we would be uh, much more at peace and, uh, I want to say, respecting different groups and what their wishes and what they want to do and I think the recall would actually like to say it would bring us more together it wouldn't be more divisive because it's those small groups when they go out to try and recall and do something they realize that wow we only have five percent of the people that are supporting us and then that other part, part can say well you know you, you've tried you you don't have a voice to recall that and it would give more strength to the cause than then undermine it I believe. Thanks, Paul. Uh, management. I believe that government should substantially be about managing a business. You need authority, you need responsibility, and you need accountability. One of the things that recall does is it drives home the accountability side of the equation. The other thing that we hopefully would get out of uh, an accountability would be to get the parties and politicians to actually adhere to the philosophy. We heard talk about conservatism, conservatism uh, ruling the province for the last 44 years. I, I don't think so. Um, when Ralph took over in 92, uh, he then showed this sign in 2004, that, that banner said, paid in full. Okay, in those 14 years, sorry, 12 years, he had paid off $23 billion in debt that Getty and Lougheed had run up. Okay, debt financing is a function of uh, progressive or liberal or NDP uh, ideology and not typically a conservative ideology. Uh, these guys are, it's like a following politicians, you're, it's like a shell game to find out who is under what, what name. Um, anyway, uh, if we had the, uh, the politicians accountable, perhaps they might stick with their true program and not uh, bend to the, the winds of polling. Okay. Thank you. For the record, that was very holistic. And uh, again, to, to, to come back to it, what, what this is, is this is about a new level of democracy, a new level of accountability, where the power resides in the people, where when there's a group, an activist that, that, that wants to be active in changing social policy, whatever it is, there's actually a, a, a mechanism to do it. Right now, to, to get involved, say, you know what, I think I'm going to join a political party because I, I want to increase the spending in education. Wow, what a, what a monumental hill to climb up. And, and the actual other side of the coin for me of recall is citizens' initiative referendum. And so if, in fact, we wanted to, let, let's say that, you know, those individuals who want free university, 
they could actually go out and start a, a petition to say, you know, in the next election we want a referendum to say we want free free tuition at our universities and we could participate. And so I actually think it would raise the level of democracy. I think that it would make uh, everybody more, uh, what would I say, engaged in those discussions on what we want to get down the road and how we want to achieve it. And we'd actually raise that, that, that overall level of understanding of the society of what makes us great. Why, why do we get to have the, the peace and the prosperity that we have today here in Alberta? And I think that a lot of us, some of us are looking at it as a glass half full, some are looking at it as a glass half empty. But the point is, is that there are economic policies, there are social policies, all of those that actually raise the level of our society. I always compare politics to flying an airplane. Um, I think everybody here been on an airplane? <laughs> How many of you have had the privilege of being down to the Smithsonian and seeing the replica of the Kitty Hawk, the first uh, uh, airplane ever built that, that flew the longest, furthest distance? I, I've had that privilege. I've always been enthralled about uh, flying. But what uh, I want to use as a real uh, fake uh, analogy here is that if you go to the Kitty Hawk, the left wing is actually uh, shorter than the right wing. And I look at the left wing as our social programs, and I look at the right wing as our economy. And the reason why the right wing was longer and bigger than the left wing is, is because they had to balance out the, the kitty hawk. And they actually had the motor, it wasn't in the center, it was off to the right, and the pilot was a little bit lighter. And so in order to balance it, they had to make sure that the left wing could support what the, the right wing had to support what it was carrying. And I believe that our economy and our country is much that way. If our economy is not functioning, at its best, um, our social programs can't be at their best. And in order for our social programs to improve and for our education, for our health care, for our senior care, in order for that to improve, we need a robust, uh, growing economy that's the best in the world. This is a world market. You can say what you want. Maybe the United States can shut its borders down and survive, but boy, Canada and the rest of the world can't. China's another one that could do that. But, but we need to be able to compete on the world market. We need sound economic policies that protect our environment but allow economy to, to boom. And we can do that. I truly believe that we can do that and balance it in such a way that we don't destroy our economy or, uh, because we're, sa we're saving the environment or vice versa. I think that we can grow our uh, economy and we can look after our environment. And again, if you look around the world, and because we've used Vene Venezuela so much, um, is there a country that's abused its environment more than Venezuela? I don't know, but most of the third world uh, developing countries uh, have a real problem with their environment. And the uh, wealthier and more productive the country is, generally the better the environment is. We have a lot of pristine parks and places that we can go here in Canada that are protected. Uh, not so in a lot of those other countries. It, it's a uh, survival of the fittest and uh, it's just, it's sad to go and see some of those areas. But anyways, is there, you, you came forward, do you have a question or comment? No, I hear you, sir. I just want to hear it again. Oh, okay. Well. Anyone uh, want to respond? I much prefer talking in a circle. This is a lecture. Um, <laughs> I'm with you. I'd be happy. So, so power lies in the mic. The people with the loudest voice have the power. Uh, and that shouldn't, you know, that's... It's, I'm not being funny about that. That's actually what, what happens. People, people uh, in power in the legislature and parliament uh, or in the corporate towers. At, at the protests. Or even at the protests, they have the megaphone, they have the power. Uh, and that drowns out engagement. It drowns out dialogue. It drowns out understanding. That's a minor point. Uh, we like to hear, we seem to be muddying the waters. Uh, we like to clarify by muddying the waters. So I'd like to bring up uh, communist Russia uh, to clarify. No, I'm kidding. Um, so one, one minor point, government is, should not be seen as a business. Um, and this is a, it's a broader debate that we ought to have, uh, maybe not now, but government has a different mandate than business, and it should. Government is responsible to uh, outcomes that are social, uh, well, political, obviously, economic, uh, environmental, um, and economic. These outcomes uh, are not tied to what is profitable. If they were, then I could say, well, look, healthcare is unprofitable, let's cut that out. 
Let's just focus on making donuts and making cheap donuts that we reheat in ovens so they taste like cardboard, like Tim Hortons. So that would kind of suck to live in a country where government treated me like a Tim Hortons donut, or sorry, a purveyor, a, a consumer of Tim Hortons donuts. I feel like I am cast out of that business decision and I suffer from it um, because I have no other donut to get. And it sucks. <laughs> um, Start a donut store. Yeah, well. <laughs> That's what free enterprise is about, is to produce a better product that, that we get more people coming to. Maybe, yeah, I don't really want to do it. Yeah. I, 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 want, I want governance, not a donut store. Yeah. But, <laughs> um, well, but we start a new party then. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, well, what was the other stuff? It was, um, again, again we're, if we're looking at a lack of democracy and participation in democracy, something you were talking about earlier, um, a participatory democracy, it takes a while to get there. It's going to be many iterations to get to a full-on participatory democracy, if that's what we think is desirable. And I think it is, and I think we can get there. And it doesn't look like having political parties. And it, it, it looks like not having corporate money in politics, or union money, um, or money, uh, really. It looks like we're invested in it. But how do we get there? Electoral form is one way. It's a, it's a very uh, liberal, not a small L liberal. It's a reformist way to get to a participatory democracy is electoral reform. Uh, getting rid of first past the post. Having more voices at the table. And yes, perhaps having minority governments. Then we have to agree on things, or at least agree to disagree on things and move forward. It's messier, but it produces perhaps better outcomes. Uh, in a business analogy, um, you know, I work for a company that works for a company, and uh, I cannot bring up certain things that I see that are missing in this company, opportunities for them to engage, because they don't, it's a family-owned business, and uh, they're very intolerant of people sort of challenging that authority, and they have the position, the, the authority to fire me, so I shut up, because my livelihood is based on that. So firing people uh, does not actually get you the benefit of their input. Having that ability to fire them actually uh, quiets them down. Um, so this is, sorry, I went back and forth there, but if we put more voices at the table and we have more voices at the table and we're listening to the quiet voices, then we're gonna have a better democracy. Uh, we're not gonna need so much uh, recall because more, more voices are already there. Um, and, and again, even from a business perspective, if we look at Germany, having the employees on the board, they have employees on the board of their corporations. 50%. 50%. 50% and 50% uh, employees and 50% business, uh, the, the business management. Uh, and this leads to very effective business. And Germany is an economic powerhouse now, perhaps where all the other countries are not. And it's not by mistake. Um, so there's bringing more voices to the table uh, and, a, and a plurality of voices and the diversity actually strengthens us. I appreciate that, and uh, I definitely agree that, that you know the more voices, the, the better. But it's still, then, if we're going to talk about democracy, whether it's a corporation in Germany, they, they still vote, and we go with the, the majority. Uh, another side of the the issue, though, when it comes to recall, which is so important, because you you mentioned that you thought it might actually reduce because someone's going to get fired, so they'll say nothing. It's, it's actually, uh, my experience would be the opposite. Many many people, many elected individuals, won't say anything because their colleagues or something are upset. When I was the leader of the Alberta Alliance, uh, back then we had the crow rate and we had the, the diversity of the grain and I had an individual that was wanting to run up in Grand Prairie and I was against the crow rate and wanting to get rid of it and he came to me and says, Paul, he says, I, I can't be part of this because I'm against the crow rate and I says, Dale, I, I says, one thing that I would absolutely see is free votes in the legislature and if your area and your group want that I would be very disappointed if you followed and did what I wanted as opposed to the people that you were representing. And so when you actually have recall, what you actually have, and again, when I ran against Diane Collier-Cart and Calgary Glenmore, it was quite a famous statement that night when she was asked in there, well, who's going to be your boss? She says, well, after I'm elected, it's going to be the premier. Well, the people were outraged. She was being honest. I'm going to be told if I say something, I'm going to get ostracized, set to the side, and not be able to be a strong voice. Um, Diane Collier-Cart has been a pretty strong independent voice on on Calgary because why there aren't any parties there's a free vote I'm all for free votes in the legislature there should only be one time in my opinion where a, 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 a party 
with would be able to say everybody needs to line up and that's a vote of confidence. Even the, the, the um, when we're voting on, on our um, budget, that, that should be individual. And, and recall should be like that, that every individual who's elected is accountable to the people who elected them, not the party, not the leader, but to elected them. And so I would argue that recall would actually strengthen the voice where a person can get up and say, you know what, if, if I don't speak out on balancing the budget, um, my people might recall me. And you wouldn't get that vote for a bad budget. And maybe it's because they wanted to spend more money in an area, so they would be up advocating that no, I want more money spent in health care or I want it spent in education. And I would argue that recall would actually raise that level of participation and you have a stronger voice from the people because they can no longer be shut down by the leader saying, oh, I'm going to throw you out. And, and absolutely, I'm not a party advocate. I, I'm for elected representatives who are free to vote the will of their people or their own conscience that they went to that house to represent those specific views. I hope that answers your question question on that. Well, thank you very much, Paul. Um, um, uh, one of the things that you mentioned about who has the mic has the power, I think that's one of the great things about Speaker's Corner. Because people, and every person can come here and make a comment and participate in the discussion and other people can hear it. And uh, I think that's really important and I think it's great that people who came and spoke today and, and asked questions, I, I'm really glad that you did that because that's the whole point of the exercise and that's really um, as small as this kernel of people might be. I think it's important that we all share our different points of view. That's the only way we can go forward. So, um, oh, thanks. So do we have uh, other questions or comments? that people would like to make? With regard to the freedom that you talk about, you're thankful for the freedom that people fought for in the last Sorry. couple of wars. Um, like, I, I don't know what uh, what information you have gotten, but after the First World War, a lot of people did not have freedoms. You know, white men had freedoms. After the Second World War, again, lesbians didn't have freedoms. Uh, First Nations didn't have freedoms. So what freedom are you talking about? Are you t just talking about the freedom of white, rich men? Uh, actually... Uh, can I answer part of that? Absolutely. Actually, uh, after World War II, that was when First Nations people in Canada were granted uh, the right to vote, and they were also uh, granted the right to consume alcohol and go to the pub, in, which they had been denied prior to World War II. Um, and people said, hey, they came and fought with us on the front lines. Give them the freedoms that we have. And um, I'm, interest, I'm reading a very interesting book right now about after World War I. There was actually a shortage of men. So in England, there were two million women who would not have husbands and, uh, because there just were no men. And so women began to make their own friendships. I believe that at that time also lesbian relationships flourished because people perhaps had that desire in the first place but had no social outlet for it prior. You know, there was no social authority that would be granted to them. But after, people saw, wow, these people have no one. You know, why should you be a woman alone if you can't have a friend of some kind, whether it be an intimate friend or just a friend? You know, so I think that gradually those freedoms have come to people and I would also say that as a career woman, there was no opportunity for women to be terribly involved in many things in the world prior to modern day reproductive technologies and, and the birth control pill. Uh, although we can look back at 1923, was it, when the fi famous five got the the right to be women were decided to be people. So, uh, you know, I think that these social changes are a progression. I don't think that it's necessarily that, you know, my white grandfather who homesteaded in Fenner, Alberta, I don't think that he said to his wife, you have to stay here in the house with the kids. It was an agrarian relationship. It was agrarian feminism where the woman said, I want children, I want to raise them, and I want to have a nice house even though it's a you know, um, uh, maybe a, a log house or a very shabby little shack. But I will take care of the cow and the milk cow and the garden and the children and stay here at the house all day 
and do the laundry and do all those menial tasks while my husband is out in the field with a yoke of leather around his neck pushing a wooden plow behind an oxen because that's how my grandfather was working all day in the field. You know, so it was the context of the time. There was not the technology to free either party. So men were tied by a yoke around their neck to a cow or an oxen, and the women were tied by apron strings to their children in the house. But actually technology liberated all of us from all of that, and now we can make many different choices. But I thought it was the two wars that liberated us, Well, that too, because of the changes. You know, there are many technological advances during war. That's one thing. There are many medical advances during both wars, all wars. There's huge medical advances because you have to save people on the front line. There are many technological advances and the changing roles of men and women through both of the most uh, famous, World War I and World War II, are very significant factors on how society changed, especially in the West. Um, so they're, they're, you know, but it is a combination of things. It's not just one thing, of course. Anyway. Yeah, how the world but, yeah, I, I'm going to comment on that, Merle. I'm, I'm going to comment on that. And, and again, I, I realize that it's always, you know, the cup's half full or half empty. And you might feel that it, it's half empty or maybe almost empty. But boy, if, if Hitler would have dominated and been a Genghis Khan and, and conquered, you know, 80% of the known world, we would not have the, the freedom, the safe, or the prosperity that we have today, in my opinion. And I think that he was a tyrant. But let, let me just finish. The, that there, There's no question the benefit, that the peace and the prosperity that we have today is because of, of the men and women who put their life on the line to, to fight the oppression and the dictators. That, well, thank you. Many communists and anarchists and the partisans too. All, all of them, but but the point the point is is that. First of all, you as an individual have the right, being a Canadian, to, to leave and to go to one of those places that, that you espouse is so wonderful, whether it's Venezuela or whatever else, but I, I can't think of anything worse. Like you think of the people, and if you read any of the books, of those that have escaped from North Korea or Myanmar, uh, there's just atrocities going on all over the world, and, and we do not have to suffer like those people do. And, the rights of Koreans been taken away by? The military? Or by the people fighting the military? Well, I, I, I'm not going to get into that debate. But, but go there. You, no, 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 seriously, go there and you can be... Who's our, who's our, bas, who's our basketball guy, uh, Rodney? Actually, was prevented from speaking freely and who were they prevented by? This is a lesson in history. I understand you want to defend the defenders of us who are the military's spokesman. But it is not true. It is not entirely you, you think North Korea is a great North place North to live? It came from people that burned alive in the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire. It came from people that were prevented from organizing by militant groups supported by industry. Let, 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 let me finish responding, then you can have your two minutes on, on, on that. But, but the freedoms that we enjoy, I believe, are second to none in the world. And anybody who wants to move and live in North Korea or Myanmar or any of those places, I say you're free to go there and, and exercise your democratic rights and try and change those places, but then stay. But, but, don't, but don't try and preach that one of those areas is better than ours or more democratic. It's, it's not. And, and it's someone uh, that, that's hallucinating on some sort of narcotic to think that that's a wonderful lifestyle to go and live under a dictator or a tyrant or 